So let's bring on Fernando so I don't butcher his name anymore. What's his last name? Angelucci. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Fernando. <laughs> Anything little, we can do uh, to make you smile. And I'm smiling every time I come on. So here's a little new mnemonic remembering device here. So Angelucci in Italian means angel of light. So Angel Lucci. Nice. Makes it I'll easier. Still, I'll still screw it up. But thanks, yeah. for, <laughs> thanks for sharing. <laughs> so our theme, uh, and again, thank you for coming on. You're always a great, great guest. We get wonderful feedback every time you're on. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. Um, our theme this month is all about the numbers. And I, you do such a great job of breaking down what you're looking for when you're looking at self-storage value add, I know you um, wholesale a lot of these properties because you're, um, you want properties that fit into your particular box. Um, so kind of give us an idea of what you're looking for in that box and how you go about uh, determining those numbers, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So we have three main verticals that we utilize to make money. So the very first is the value add transactions, buying mom and pop facilities, typically in secondary and tertiary markets. What we look for in that vertical is 30,000 plus net rentable square feet with the ability to expand up to 60 to 65,000 square feet. If it's below that or if it's above that, then it's something for our wholesale list. So we'll send it out to our investors. And that works out really well because the primary uh, investors on our list that receive deals from us are either just getting started in self-storage or are on the completely opposite side. And they have you know a couple million square feet and they're really looking for large acquisitions at that point. So that's the main vertical. All the way on the other side of the spectrum, we have our ground up developments. So the problem with trying to purchase facilities that are existing that are over 65,000 square feet is that you start competing with the REITs and the hedge funds and the private equity funds. And they have much lower cost of capital than we do. So they can typically drive the cap rate down, compress the cap rate down into the four, four and a half or five percent range. And I'm just not willing to buy properties at that type of unlevered return. For that type of return, I'd rather just put my money in the stock market and not have to do any work. So on the ground up side, what we're typically looking for is if we're going vertical, you know, we're always going to be building class A REIT grade facilities. So if we're going vertical, I'm going to need at least four to five acres. Um, I'm typically going to be buying that acreage anywhere between fifty dollars to $250,000 an acre. And that spread depends on how much work I have to do the land. If the utilities are already there and it's flat and uh, there's already a retention pond in place, I may be paying you know closer to that two hundred and fifty or even three hundred thousand dollars an acre range. But if it's heavily wooded and I have to bring utilities from you know all the way down by the public road uh, and it's not flat, I'm going to have to bring dirt in or I'm going to have to shovel dirt out. Uh, then you start creeping down closer to that fifty dollars or $50,000 an acre. And it roughly translates to, to about one to $5 a foot if you're more used to um, buying in the per square foot range as opposed to per acre. Now, with the pandemic that has hit the country recently, a lot of the supplies that we use and the materials that we use were affected pretty negatively. And that includes steel prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so with steel, we've seen a three, four, five hundred percent increase in price, depending on what type of steel oh. we're buying. And mm -hmm. because of that, we had to get creative and start pivoting our strategy to build these class A REIT grade development. So what we started doing was going after the uh, big box retail space, which has been slowly dying for the last 20 years. But COVID mm -hmm. really put kind of the, the, the nail in the coffin there. Mm -hmm. So we were able to start finding these big box retail stores and by big box retail, what I typically mean is like Sears building circuit cities, Kmart's Walmart's, maybe some grocery stores. Mm -hmm. They're typically on main and main. They're surrounded by dense residential. Uh, everyone has uh, some, some good disposable income to be, to be utilizing. And what I look for in those types of properties is anywhere between 50 to 150,000 square feet. And the reason why I have that large range is on 
the REIT grade side, our buyers are these large, you know, large publicly traded companies, and they really only want to transact on facilities that are, you know, 80 plus thousand square feet. With that being said, self-storage has an efficiency rate of anywhere between 75 to 85%. So what I mean by that is if I have a hundred thousand square foot box, I'm going to lose about 20 to 25% of that square footage to hallways, mechanical closets, offices, bathrooms, things like that. Sure. So that's why we're looking for something that's around the 100,000, 150,000 square foot range. However, if that big box has a clear height or a, a roof height that is high enough, and what clear height means is measured to the bottom of the rafters. So literally clear, there's nothing impeding your impeding your ability to go up. If it has a clear height of 22 feet or better, I can typically mezzanine a level in there. So I can actually put two, two levels of storage inside of one building. And that mm -hmm. allows me to start going after big box stores that are in the 40, 50, 60,000 square foot range, as opposed to reaching for those large facilities. Sure. So with that being said, what we've found is after the pandemic, we were able to start picking up these big box stores for pretty cheap. Um, anywhere between 10 to $20 a foot. And that allows us to do two things. The first is it allows us to cut our construction time in half. So as opposed to spending 12 months to build a ground up development, uh, we're allowed to compress that down to about six months because we already have the envelope in place. The sure. second piece of that construction timeline is the fact that in some climates, we can't pour concrete because it's too cold, like in the Midwest or in the North. And sometimes we can't pour because it's too hot, like in the South, in, in Texas or Florida. Mm -hmm. So that also insulates us or weathers us in from the environment. The second piece is it also drops our total cost of, of construction or total project cost by anywhere between a third to a half. Wow. So typically I can build a ground up construction for $100, $110 a square foot. When I go to the adaptive reuse or these conversion projects, my total project cost is typically in the 60 to $70 a square foot range, but I can still wow. sell those at the same cap rates that I would those ground up developments. Nice. Wow.